Сега е време да преминем към първият ни лектор. Всъщност той е първият ни чуждестранен лектор, който каним за втори път. Той се занимава от 15 години с QA и ще ни разкаже за някои погрешни схващания в тестването на софтуер. Когато представихме Клаудио миналата година, представенето беше на български язик, той много го хареса, разбира се, но за съжаление нищо не разбра. Затова тази година решихме да го представим на румънски язик. За съжаление, това, което успяхме да намерим на румънски... Единственият румънски, който намерихме е този сок. Той е този оригинал е румънски. Така, колега, моля, стискайте палци. Фабрикатън Румъния. Калитате де екшепсие ши примията. Аледжера ами де персоане. Ефект енерджизант. Тоник ши ревигорант. Богат ан принципе активе. Минерале, витамине, олигоелементе, ензиме ши аминоачизи. Умбуната теще мемория, атенция ши путера де концентраре, а се пъстра локускат ши ракорос. Домнилор ши домнилор, Клаудио Дръгия! Should be able to him. Hi, добри утро. Thank you for the nice introduction. Actually, it was kind of nonsense, but it it will do just fine. So we're going to start this wonderful day by talking about misconceptions about software testing. A few words about me. I'm from Bucharest, Romania. It's my fifth time here in Bulgaria. I started testing back in 2004. My last job was as quality manager at Capgemini, Romania, and currently I'm on parental leave. This means that I get to stay at home, play some games that I don't like very much, change diapers, clean up, prepare food, and stuff like that. I have up until October, then I'm back on testing. This is my website, my email, Twitter, if you want to get in touch. I'll be around here the whole day, so if you want to talk about something, just pop in. So, for the beginning, a few words about misconceptions. What is a misconception? In my view, it's an opinion that is incorrect because it's based on faulty thinking or understanding. And this is my latest example. It's from the magazine that I found on the plane while coming here, and it says something about Agile, and the conclusion is that they allow project managers to maintain a sustained working pace. Like, what? <laughs> and this is the seventh principle from where I think they got the idea. But it says the sponsor developers and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Nothing about project managers. So these kind of misconceptions, you find them a lot in all sorts of places. But why this talk, and especially about software testing? I like to fight misconceptions about software testing because I really love the craft. And I hate it when people have bad opinions or things not so highly about software testing. But the main question is, why does this happen? And I believe the first reason is that there is no magic book of software testing. There isn't one single place where you could get all the knowledge, some ideas about the skills that you need, and everybody would agree upon it. The testing world is divided between different ideologies, let's say, it, and sometimes because of financial interests. And because there isn't such a book of testing, we see things differently and fail to understand different perspective. Even though we're looking at the same thing, we call it differently, we do different things about it. And also because we live in bubbles. We live in our projects, within our teams, within our companies, and don't get outside to gather feedback from peers, talk about our experiences, share some knowledge. Now, misconceptions have a terrible effect on testing. First of all, they make our lives harder, right? work more difficult, there are endless debates and discussion, especially with people in 
higher management. They hinder our understanding of the testing craft and they promote illusions and wrong expectations about software testing. You would say that there are not so many misconceptions, but what I have here is a list of 35 plus misconceptions that I managed to find during my 14 years experience. There are a lot of things that are not well understood and are perceived differently. Unfortunately, we won't have enough time to go through all of them, but if you want to go through all of them, I built this small website, it's called Misconceptions about Software Testing, .brain4it.com, where you can enter your name and then select if you agree with the misconceptions. If you agree, it will move on to the next one. If you do not agree, it will give you my arguments and you will still be forced to say yes in order to move to the next one. <laughs> the point of the exercise is just to get an idea about them. Now, let's start with the first one. Everybody can test, right? How many times have you heard this? Too many. Okay, saying that everyone can test is just saying like everyone can drive, right? How many of you are drivers? Pretty much everybody. So do you believe that everyone can drive? No, so it's kind of strange that people in IT have this idea that everyone can test. And it's really like difficult to fight it. How do you fight it? How do you get a manager to understand that not everyone can test, right? My best argument is the testing map. It's the mind map that I build in regards to what a tester should know. So if somebody says to me, everyone can test, okay, they have to know this, and they have to have some additional skills that are not mentioned here. Plus, they need some experience, right? And then I get everything in my favor. Of course, there is a little bit of denial at the beginning, but I have something to show them. But I have a question for you. Why do you think this happens? Why do people in IT believe that anyone can test and sometimes that the tester's salary should be less than a developer? Could it be that we as testers don't highlight our benefits, don't talk a lot to our team members about what we are doing or how we are doing it? Could it be that we don't promote testing within our let's say company or group of friends, or if a friend asks you, what do you do? I'm a tester. Ah. <laughs> and you end the discussion there. Well, the point that I want to make here is that sometimes we are to be blamed because we do not highlight what we do, how we do it. We never talk about the difficulties, about the challenges that we face, so that in the end, most people think that everyone can test, right? They just see you on the keyboard and you report bugs or give out information. I believe that at a certain level, it's our fault that this happens. Our fault as a tester. Now, let's move to the next one. Testing can be done under any circumstances and everything can be tested, right? Well, testing can be done only if there is testability, right? If there is testability, then you can test. If there is no testability, no testing can be done. But sounds a little bit fancy, right? What is testability? And I have here a small friend of mine that I always use him to explain testability. He's what I call the testability bug. His name written right here is Chaos UI, right? And Chaos is actually an acronym for controllability, heterogeneity, automatability, observability, separation of concerns, understandability, isolability, everything that you need in order to properly test something. All of these, you use them as a tester. Without these, testing cannot be done. Testability is not something that is only up to the tester. It's a team's approach. It should be not an accident, but a conscious decision. A conscious decision from the team, from the approach you, you want to take. Testability is also the root cause of many production bugs. And you spend a lot of time fixing them. Do you know what's the biggest desire a bug ever has? What does a bug want? To go in production, right. It's what it lives for, to go in production. And if you have everything that you need, then you can 
make him unhappy. You can find him where you still have time. So another misconception, testing cannot be done without specifications, right? What do you think about this? Do you agree, disagree? Many times I've seen testers complain about the lack of formal specifications. But in, there are, let's get it right, there are certain situations when you need formal specifications. But there are many others where you do not need formal specification. Knowledge is in the people's mind. You go there, you talk with them, you look over the application. It's not necessary to have everything formally specified. Of course, the outcome will be determined by the nature of the product. There is one thing to test a banking application, totally different to test a small application on the phone. It depends also on the tester knowledge of the domain. Do you know about banking? Do you know something about using phones? Totally different knowledge areas. The skills and professionalism of the tester. You know, we talk a lot about seniors, juniors, testers. We talk seldom about professional testers, right? Also, there is the question of the availability of resources. Do you have everything you need? Yes or no? Do you have access to some sort of information? Yes or no? And everything depends on the approach you take. Especially in this case where you don't have formal specifications, you need to use exploratory testing. Now, another nice misconception. Understanding requirements means reading them. Okay? One thing straight. Reading is never enough. You're not reading like a book, a story, poetry or something like that. You need to use certain techniques, like critical thinking questions, sashimi, simulate and model, cubing, drawing diagrams and flows. Drawing is extremely useful if you try it. Just put something on a piece of paper, it will make your day much better. Uh, by the way, this is a sketch note for all the things that I'm showing you. Here you have on the left the link. Next, texts are executable specifications, right? Wrong. If you have a specification either as a user story or as a software requirement specification document, all you might be able to get from them are some positive tests and some scenarios. There are a lot of other things. You have to take into account the definition of the negative test, security, performance, test every claim, because not everything is specified. All of these are valuable information, will give you valuable information that you can provide to stakeholders. Now we come up to a, let's say, more debatable part. Manual versus automated testing, right? What do you think about it? I've seen that it's used also here. Well, let me break it to you. All testing is manual. Programming is also manual, it's done with the hands. Okay, saying that testing is manual gives it a, not such an important aspect. Manual work is something that we view for the, how can I put it, not so smart people. They could not make it, they do manual stuff. But you use the keyboard, remember, it's all manual. Michael Bolton has one nice quote, he says that, we help to cheapen and demean the craft by using manual next to testing. So if you're a tester, it's up to you to fight this misconception. Stop saying manual testing. And now we move off to the next part, the most interesting one, about automation. A lot of people think of automated testing as having a robotic arm. When in fact, you're just having a small grabbing tool. And that's it. So, let's get it straight. First of all, it's not automated testing. The proper word is test automation. Totally different aspect, okay? So what do you do when you automate a test? First, you test manually, right? You do the test by hand. Then you decide to automate it, you use a tool, and you specify all the checks have, that have to be done. Not everything makes it on the list. You're not checking everything. You have to clearly specify what has to be checked, right? Yeah? Okay, so then why should we call it test automation if it's actually check automation? 
It sounds fancier to say test automation, right? No other check beside the specified one will ever be done. The program will never say, hmm, that's odd. I should check this also. Never ever. Then you debug it in case of failure, you update or remove it. But sometimes I've seen many testers being scared of automation when they hear the word. They are like birds are with scarecrows. They get frightened about it. There is no reason to get frightened about it. I have never heard of a single person being fired because his or her team managed to automate so much that they were no longer needed. Have you ever heard of such a person? No? So let's not be scared of automation. What I've heard of was people being fired because they were unable to automate things. Right? And this is extremely important because in testing, you always need to find this optimal area of testing, to find the balance between cost of testing and number of defects. Right? Too little, you under-test. Too much, you over-test. Automation allows you to optimize this area if it's the case, if it's applicable. Right? Now, let me tell you a real story about automation. Do you know what ATM stands for? It stands for Automated Teller Machine. A teller is a person that some time ago stood at the office at the bank, you gave them your ID, a request, a written request for money, and they would verify that you're the person entitled, and they would give you the money. It sounds like a lot of manual work, right? Well, it was in the 70s, we got these ATMs that completely replaced a person's activity, right? When you see this kind of automation, you know exactly for the type of job they are going through, right? The teller won't be there anymore. We have ATMs. But what we fail to do is imagine what jobs it will create or facilitate. In 1970s, in the US, there were like 250 million tellers. In 2017, worldwide, sorry, were like 500 million tellers. How come if there is an ATM machine that does their job, within 50 years, their number doubled? How is this possible? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Once they had no more manual work to do, they could focus on customer service, on loans, on investment, on totally different activities. So automation might replace a certain type of job, but it will always facilitate other types of activities. This is why you always have to learn. Do you know about the test automation pyramid? This famous pyramid that it says, when you automate things, you have to think about unit test, component, integration system, and at the end, the GUI, right? And there are some things that you always have to take into account for system and integration. You would need mockups and a build and a deploy. For component and unit, usually you can do them on a local machine. But the aspect that we tend to forget is that the higher you go on the pyramid, the more it costs the more it takes to run them, the more maintenance is needed, they're more fra fragile. There is more coverage or less coverage, there is more debugging time, definitely. So, when you think about automation, the reality should look something like this. I've seen many situations where people focus on the GUI, but don't focus on the unit test. Once I ran a project, and for every 100 failed tests, we found one bug. One bug for 100 failed tests. Within two weeks, we stopped everything. It was no longer worth it. The debugging time was too much. And then we, we understood that unit tests are the things to go with, not necessarily tests in the interface. Next one. You really like it. Quality assurance is, is testing, right? Wrong. Quality assurance is not testing. Quality assurance is something that has to be integrated within a larger picture, something that is called the quality management system. Now let's do a crash course, five minutes, what a quality management system is like. First, 
you need to answer a simple question. How do you want to do things? You need to establish processes and activities, right? Then you need a way of tailoring them. How will you use them in this particular context? Because not all contexts are the same. Next, what do you do? You start to do the product, and then you get the final product. You need an activity that is called quality control and has to answer a simple question. Are we doing what we said we will do in these phases? So you start to ch check the usage of the process, the process and the product, and then the final product. And then you need to have some activity for process improvement that will change everything based on the actual results. Where, where does testing fit in all this? Somewhere around here. As testers, for instance, you are not responsible for the quality of the code, right? You are not responsible for the quality of the specifications. You give feedback in regards to what you need and how you need it to be done, but you are not responsible for it. The job of maintaining such a system is the job of what's called the quality manager. It's another invented title. You don't see quality managers in nature, right? It's a title, it's a responsibility given to someone. It's more than only one person can do. Quality is everybody's business. Now, testers need to find bugs, right? Well, I believe that testers should be like the headlights of a car. You should provide information about the current status of the project, but also make predictions. Why? In order for the driver to adjust speed or change the direction. As testers, we provide information to stakeholders, and some of those informations are bugs. But bugs are not everything. If somebody asks you, can we deliver this in production, what do you say? Five bugs. No, you <laughs> say, yes, no, it takes a little bit longer. We need more time to test this. There are a lot of information that you can give outside bugs. What kind of information? Some time ago, I built this sketch note about measures. It contains around 40 measures that you can do. Some are relevant, some are stupid. Some are like really stupid, like counting test cases and executions, things that I've seen a lot. If you want to count test cases, why not count lines of code? Why not count how many people come with black shirts in the morning? It's totally useless. It doesn't provide any information or any good information that would allow you to make a decision. Testers break software. What do you think? Is this true? It's never true. The software is already broken. What we do is break illusions by providing relevant information. Now, this is a tricky one. Testers with five years' experience are seniors. If you look at the state of testing report, you can see that there is definitely an increase in salary the more experience you have. Here we have for Eastern Europe and Russia, with one year you have around $90,000, $9, and somewhere within 10 plus years you get around 700. So, what do you think? Are you a senior in this case if you're paid more? Well, it seems that the industry is going this way. But I believe it's not quite true, and let me tell you why. Let's assume that you got hired in 2030, right? And you do something in the first year. But then again, you do the same thing over and over again. You get five years' experience, right? In what? In what you have done in the first year. I believe that you are a senior tester if you can succeed in any other project, team, or technology. Of course, there is a learning curve. You cannot move from one team to another and be 100% performance the next day. But you will have what it takes to succeed. Do you agree with me? Okay. I always hear testers complain that they don't have enough time and you have to work more. I'm sure it happened to you also. But what I found is that you can turn things around. If you get a manager to come to you and say, you have two hours to test everything, go, 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 go. What do you do? You go and you give your best shot, right? You do in two hours what you could do in six, then why not do it in two in the first place? What I believe you should do is 
put some fire under his ass. <laughs> Stated clearly and simple, this is what I have to test. This is how much time it takes, what should I do in two hours? You will see how things turn around, how they, everybody starts to ask about how much time does it take, can I help you, can we do anything to make it easier? Put the fire under somebody else's ass. Stop trying to do in two hours what you can do in six hours. It's not possible. You will work faster, but not better. You have more chances of failing under pressure than not failing. Testers are the bearer of bad news. Well, if you come to, let's say, any Scrum meeting and say nothing worse, worst bill ever, two clicks and it all crashed, half implemented, lost my time waiting for this. Of course, you will become the bearer of bad news, right? Everybody will start to hate you. You're that bad thing that comes up every morning and complains for 15 minutes. But I have a solution. What you should say is, we are not done yet. This is what I believe we should do. Just saying these simple words, not done yet, opens the door for opportunities. You state to the team what you need, how we can succeed, what else has to be done, instead of just complaining and giving a negative emotions to everybody. So try to use these words, and together we'll fight this misconception. It's okay and good to test at the end of the sprint. How many of you are working with sprints? Okay, long enough. Has this happened to you? to always test at the end of the sprint? I guess it's true in many situations. What I would like to point out is some clear facts. We have the Scrum Guide, where it says, Scrum teams deliver products iteratively and incrementally, maximizing the opportunities for feedback, right? Well, what kind of maximization is there if you test at the end? How can you maximize if you test at the end? You provide valuable information at the end. There is, sounds like no maximization to me. The seventh principle from the Agile Manifesto. Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Can you maintain a constant pace if you're always under pressure at the end of the sprint? Can you actually do it? So testing at the end of the sprint, it's a no-go. We have to learn to build products iteratively and incrementally. This means testing one bit at a time, making sure that it works. Next one. Testing is what testers do. No, it's not. Testing is an activity. Everybody does testing. We talked uh, earlier about unit tests that are done by developers. When we do a review meeting, the product owner actually validates the implementation. Verification and validations are two basic principles in software testing. So everybody does some sort of testing. As a tester, you could be, let's say, a champion or a promoter of testing. But testing is not just what the testers do. Testing is not a structured activity, right? Well, we have principles that can guide us. We have approaches, we have techniques that we can use. How can you say that it's not structured? It's like very structured. All you need is to make sense in your own head about what testing is. Testing can find all the bugs. Well, I don't know. I think it kind of depends on your goal. You want to find all the bugs? Well, you have to have a lot of money. You need people, resources, and time. Are you sure you don't want to have some sort of balance between how many bugs you find or when we deliver in production? Because in the end, it's a business. You have to make money. I believe that if you put a lot of effort into it, you can find all the bugs. But the question is, is it feasible to find all the bugs? Remember that, uh, for instance, on Facebook, I've seen that they test things straight into production. Okay, they're not struggling to find all the bugs, but to find those means of fixing bugs quicker. Because no matter how much effort there you put in, there is always the chance that a small bug or a bigger bug will slip into production. 
So when that is the case, you have to be like really, really quick to fix it. Production bugs, the testers have failed. Have you ever heard this thing? You have failed. There are bugs in production. But the question is, did you have all you need? Have you asked for it in advance? If that is the case, then highlight what was missing, what you needed in order for those nasty bugs not to go into production first. Unfortunately, this was it. We're running out of time. We have five more minutes for questions. And do we still have t-shirts? How many t-shirts? Three t-shirts. So for the first three questions, we have one t-shirt. <laughs> no, for every question, we have a t-shirt. So are there any questions? No, we have one. No questions? <laughs> Nothing? Just say it to me and I'll relate to everybody. not everything can be automated. True, and this, this comes up because we fail to promote what is actually testing. And uh, I have, let's say, a small example. We believe that everything can be automated because we believe that testing is an analytical activity. I have built the website, it's called testingchallenges.testingmap.org, where you can do some small challenges. And the last one is how to test a login page. Try to give him some time to build some scenarios to test that logging page. Build the scenarios in advance and see how many bugs can you find with those scenarios. Since you believe that testing is analytical, then you might tend to believe that everything can be automated. But it's never the case. And the sad reality is that sometimes you need to fail in order to understand this. Thanks. Okay. We have two more t-shirts. No? So... <laughs> Mic check. Should I come ne there? Hey guys, I have one question. So we have Victor there. Yeah, and we also have Victor. Can, can you just stand up and shout? <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the lecture. I've seen this a lot, and uh, I've experienced most of these misconceptions. I saw in your slides uh, something around testability, and it was uh, two techniques that I'm not aware of. One is called sashimi, and the other one is called cubin. Can you tell us more information about so, this? So, sashimi is a principle of, that tries to answer a simple question. How do you eat an elephant? <laughs> one slice at a time. So whatever your work is, whatever requirements you have, first step was to slice them into small pieces. Try to make sense of it. Refer to them on pages as functionalities, and as everything you'd like, but it should work. Cubing is a small technique that says you understand something if you are able to explain it, compare it, uh, associate it, describe it. It contains a little bit of measures for yourself if you have understood something. And usually it's built up like a cube where you can write the questions and you can just throw it away and try to answer them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And the last question. Here it is. Uh, on your left. On my left, okay. At the end. <laughs> Where is the microphone? Over here. Okay, I'll okay. just ask. Okay. So you said that tests are not executable documentation. So is this uh, true for unit tests as well? 
Can, just for, can you is, say it again? Is this true for the unit tests as well, or you're just referring to the UI ones? Mostly to the UI, but then you have to think about how do you want to do the unit tests? Because that's on the development side, and that's how, how you want to build it. You can use techniques like test-driven development or whatever you think is suited for yourself, but understanding the specifications and building automation are two things that go hand in hand. I mean, you build unit tests for the code that you build, the code that is supposed to do something. Have, have I managed to answer your question? Yeah, ju just to add that uh, test automation is also a development activity, so we also write unit tests. So this should be applicable to us too, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, thanks. Thank so I guess this is it. We're running out of time. So thank you again very much. I'll be around the whole day if you want to talk. <laughs>